Okay, so welcome to the Sutta class for this afternoon. We're going to be looking at Anatta Pindika uh, Ovada Sutta, the uh, discourse on advice to Anatta Pindika. Imagine Nikaya number 143, this being the first uh, sutta of the last chapter of the Majjhima Nikaya, the first out of the last ten. And this particular sutta having a uh, somewhat extensive list of uh, parallels. Although uh, when you look more closely, the, the list of parallels is uh, mostly made up of semi-parallels rather than full parallels. Uh, in the Chinese, we have <coughs> one uh, version in the Ekotarika Agama of the possibly Mahasangika school. And uh, we don't find a version in the Madhyama Agama. So there's no versions in the Chinese parallel to the current sutta, a uh, par- parallel collection to the current collection, uh, and a few partial parallels in Pali. So these are suttas that are similar or deal with similar circumstances. Uh, and the earlier edition of the um, uh, comparative tables by Akanuma uh, lists a certain sutta in the Majjhima Agama, Majjhima Agama 28, as a parallel. Uh, but this seems to be a mistake, uh, as it's, uh, it's similar to another sutta in the Pali, which is talking about Sariputta's instructions to Anati Pindika, where Anati Pindika recovered rather than dying. Okay, uh, so let's have a look at the sutta. The main, one of the main unique points about the sutta is that it uh, records. Uh, Anatta Pindika's uh, somewhat surprising response to receiving a deathbed teaching. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's park. Now, on that occasion, the household Anatta Pindika was afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. Then he addressed a certain man thus, saying, Come, good man, go to the Blessed One, pay homage in my feet with your head at his feet, and say, Venerable Sir, the householder Anatta Pindika is afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at the Blessed One's feet. And then go to the Venerable Sariputta, pay homage in my name with your head at his feet, and say, Venerable Sir, the household Nata Pindiga is afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at Venerable Sariputta's feet. And then say, It would be good, Venerable Sir, if the Venerable Sariputta would come to the residence of the household Nata Pindiga out of compassion. So already some, somewhat interesting in the introduction. So we have here Nata Pindiga who... Uh, who was the uh, the the greatest disciple uh, supporter of the uh, uh, the Buddha and the Sangha? Uh, somebody who'd been uh, extraordinarily generous for many years. The greatest male disciple. Thank you for the correction. Yes, uh, and. Here he is suffering, and where we learn that he's going to he's actually dying, and asks someone to go and pay respects to the Buddha and to Sariputta. But it, curiously enough, he doesn't say, "Oh, may the Buddha come and see me when in my sickness." So maybe he's maybe even he doesn't merit a a, a visit from the Buddha, and if he doesn't get one, then who does? I wonder. No, sorry, put to passed away first. Well, he's done, he just told his friend to mate to go and pay respects to him, so he must have been there. Yeah. I think it's the same one. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, here's a brief bio of an Pindika. He was a, a banker or seti. Uh, seti more, really means a millionaire, but it's fair enough these days. Most millionaires are bankers. Uh, who became famous because of the 
unparalleled generosity to the Buddha. His first meeting with the Buddha was given during the first year after the Enlightenment in Rajagaha, a story given in the Vinaya, whether uh, Anathapindika had come on business. His wife was the sister of the uh, Seti, the... Uh, how, how would you translate that? No, the, the Seti of Rajagaha, the, 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 the magnate. That magnate might be good, the local magnate of Rajagaha. It's not a word you hear these days, but there you go. And when he arrived, he found the seti preparing a meal for the Buddha and his monks on so splendid a scale that he thought that a wedding was in progress or that the king had been invited on learning the truth. He became eager to visit the Buddha and did so very early the next morning. He was so excited by the thought of the visit that he got up three times during the night. When at last he started out for the Sitawana, the cool grove, the road was quite dark, but a friendly yaka, sivaka, sped him on with words of encouragement. By force of his piety, the darkness vanished. The Buddha was staying in the Sita one night when Anathapindika reached there, spirits opened the door for him. He found the Buddha walking up and down, meditating in the cool air of the early dawn. The Buddha greeted him and talked to him on various aspects of the Dhamma. Anathapindika was immediately converted and became a stream enterer. He invited the Buddha to a meal the next day, providing everything himself. Although the Seti, the mayor of Rajagaha, and King Bibisara asked to be allowed to help. Uh, after the uh, meal, he asked the Buddha to spend the rainy season at Savati, and the Buddha accepted, saying, The Tathagatas, O householder, take pleasure in solitude. I understand, O blessed one, I understand, was the reply. So then he went back to uh, Savati, giving gifts and so on along the way. Um, and then when he arrived in Savati, he looked for a quiet spot. And then he bought a park belonging to Prince Jeta, and he erected on there the famous Jetawana, Jeta's monastery. And the result of this and numerous other benefactions in the course of the in the cause of the Sasana, he became to be recognised as the chief of arms givers. Anatapindika's personal name was Sudatta, but uh, he always was called Anatapindika, the feeder of the poor. He was. Uh, Okay, so he fed a hundred monks in his house daily. Uh, in addition to meals provided for guests, people of the village, invalids, and so on. Five hundred seats were always ready in his house for any guests who might come. Um, so... His son wasn't particularly pious, but the daughters were very much so. Um, uh, there, Aunt Pindig is mentioned in a lot of Jataka stories and so on, which I won't go in um, to detail. Uh, background. So if you want to look at the dictionary of party proper names, uh, you can see uh, more of the details on uh, an Atapindika. Uh, okay, so that's anyway, that's enough background. <laughs> Yes, sir, the man replied he went to the Buddha, paid homage to him, and then paid, went to the Sariputta, and then came, paid, paid homage to him, uh, and then invited him to Anathapindika's house. So Sariputta dressed, taking his bowl and robe, and went to the house of Anathapindika, and said, I hope you're getting well, household. I hope you're comfortable. I hope your painful feelings are subsiding and not increasing, and that their subsiding and not their increase is apparent. Venerable Sariputta, I'm not getting well, I'm not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing, not subsiding. Their increase and not their subsiding is apparent, just as if a strong man were splitting open my head with a sharp sword, so too violent winds cut through my head. Just as if a strong man were tightening a tough leather strap around my head as a headband, so too there are violent pains in my head. 
Just as if a skilled butcher or his apprentice were to carve up an ox's belly with a sharp butcher's knife, so too violent winds are carving up my belly. Just as if two strong men were to seize a weaker man by both arms and roast him over a pit of hot coals, so too there was there is a violent burning in my body. I'm not getting well. I'm not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing, not subsiding. Their increase and not their subsiding is apparent. So he's fairly straightforward about the <laughs> about his condition. So sorry, put to replies. Then householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to the eye, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the eye. Thus you shall train. I will not cling to the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the mind that you will train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to form, sounds, smells, uh, fla uh, flavors, and touches. I will not cling to mind objects, and my consciousness will not be dependent on mind objects. You should train thus. I will not cling to eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness, and my consciousness will not be dependent on mind consciousness. Somewhat curious little way of putting things. Um, but anyway. Go on, yep. What it means will probably become apparent in just a moment, okay? I think. But if it doesn't, then ask the question again. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to eye contact, ear contact, nose contact, tongue contact, body contact, mind contact. And my consciousness will not be dependent on mind contact. Thus you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to feeling born of eye contact or other forms of contact. I will not cling to the earth element. I will not cling to the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element. I shall not cling to the consciousness element, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the consciousness element. Thus, you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to material form, feelings, perception, uh, sankharas, activities, and consciousness, and my consciousness will not be dependent on consciousness. Was this being the five aggregates? Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to the base of infinite space, infinite consciousness, base of nothingness. I will not cling to the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And my household and my, my consciousness will not be dependent on the base of neither perception nor non-perception. I will you should train yourself thus. I will not cling to this world, and my consciousness will not be dependent on this world. I will not cling to the world beyond, and my consciousness will not to be dependent on the world beyond. Thus you should train. Householder, you should train yourself thus. I will not cling to what is seen or heard or sensed or cognized or encountered. It's not sensed, seen or heard or thought or cognized, encountered, sought after and examined by the mind, and my consciousness will not be dependent on that that thus you should train. When this was heard, the householder and Artapindika wept and shed tears. <laughs> sure. Which which paragraph? The weeping and shedding tears one? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Which which paragraph? Ah, uh, the one with the sense in it. Yampi dip tang sutang mutang vinyatang patang pariesitang anu pariesitang anu charitang manasa. So whatever is seen, heard, mutang is means thought. Whatever has been thought. Yeah. Vinyatang cognized. Patang, whatever's been attained. Yeah, so it probably turns to meditation attainments. Pariesitang, anu pariesitang, anu charitang. So whatever's been explored and thought out with the mind, so I think it's talking about like. I'm not going to be attached even like to ideas and concepts, things that I've, um, you know, been over with my mind or any kind of fantasies or ideas or anything like that. So it's fairly comprehensive. Okay, so we'll come on 
to an art Pindica's response a bit later, but I'll just go over that uh, a little bit over that teaching because there are some things in the parallels which clarify certain rather curious aspects of that particular teaching. Okay, so to have a look at the parallels, <coughs> uh, the first part of the sutta uh, has a parallel in the Sangita Agama. So just get us to have a look once more at the table of parallels, uh, which is here. Okay, so this is a complete one, the partial parallels. Um, so one minor difference in this story, the background story is that according to the Sangyukta Agama and Ekotarika Agama versions, these two versions here, um, there was no invitation from Anatta Pindika. Uh, according to uh, the Sangyukta Agama, Sariputta had simply heard about the sick condition of Anatta Pindika, whereas according to the Ekotrika Agama, he knew about it because of his uh, divine eye, his psychic powers. The Anatta Pindika Sutta reports that when he arrived, um, with a, he, 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 Sanatha Pindika described his deteriorating situation with a series of similes. However, according to the Ekotarika Agama version, he merely said that his condition was getting worse without all of the elaborate similes. Um, uh, all of the versions uh, agree that uh, Sariputta instructed Anatta Pindika on the development of detachment towards the various aspects of experience. In all versions, these instructions take up the six objects of the senses, encouraging Anatta Pindika to avoid clinging to them and not let his consciousness become dependent on them. While the Majjhima Nikaya version simply speaks of consciousness becoming dependent on the senses or their objects, the Sangyukta Agama version specifies that such dependence takes place through the arising of desire and lust. The Anattapindika Sutta stands alone in also applying the instructions to the six types of consciousness, the six types of contact, and the six types of feeling that arise based on them. Uh, so Analio has a table here which gives uh, a lot more details. I'll just kind of summarize the, 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 the table here. So... Um, according to most of the other versions, or the other, the other two versions, we have the recollection for the six sense organs, eye, ear, nose, and so on, and then the six sense uh, objects, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch, uh, for the six elements, earth, wind, fire, and so on, and for the five aggregates, Aggregates, the uh, uh, form, feeling, perception, activities, and consciousness. Um, the uh, Ekotarika, so that's the Sangyukta Agama version. The Ekotarika Agama, the second version in Chinese, uh, adds on to that as well as those ones. It also has three recollections, which are. I'm not sure if says what three recollections they are. Presumably, yeah. Yes, it, it is, yeah. yeah. It's in the footnote there, yeah. So, so that's a recollection of the Buddha Dharma Sangha, which is quite, I mean, it's quite a common recommendation to someone on their deathbed, and to sort of give them confidence and so on. Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, presumably, it's to recollect. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of okay. Uh, yeah, he just taught the recollection. He didn't say don't cling to it. He just taught the recollection, uh, and this also adds the dependent origination. Dependent. Oops. Nation. So that's the um, that's the second Chinese version. So this is the SA version. This is the EA version. 
I find all the details in an ALIO study, so you don't need to write it down or whatever, but it's all here. Um, and so the main point of this is to then, then to see that in the uh, Pali version we have quite an extended list going well beyond those, and as we've just heard, uh, we have those ones. We also have the uh, six sense objects and the six kinds of consciousness. Six consciousness, and then the six contacts, six contacts, and the six feelings, and so on and so forth. Uh, so and then six elements, six five aggregates, and then the six feelings, and then the four immaterial attainments. This world and the next world. Next world. And what is seen, heard, etc. So anyway, a lot a lot of things added to that in the Pali. So clearly the Pali's been subject to elaboration there. Uh, the other ones more or less uh, similar. But uh, you know the, the 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 topics are still quite closely related, and these teachings on the six senses and six sense organs, and so on, uh, often found in either uh, more elaborate or less elaborate forms, and uh, also very closely related to the teaching on dependent origination. So even though there's some difference in the detail there, uh, there's no major difference in the uh, actual sense of the topic. Uh, I'll just go on with the uh, comparative study before we see if that's answered our questions that we had. Um, so the Okotarika Agama versions uh, take up, do not mention the senses but only their objects. Later, uh, so the Okotarika Agama doesn't mention the sense, oh, it doesn't mention the sense organs, so it doesn't have that one. Um, uh, however, later in the discourse, it takes up the senses for a more detailed treatment, explaining that when a sense arises, one does not know from where it comes, when it ceases, and one doesn't know where it goes. The Kotarika Agama discourse continues by hi hi highlighting that all things manifest by way of dependent arising, uh, and then gives the 12 links. Um, the Sangyukta Agama version agrees with the Majjhima Nikaya account in examining six elements and five aggregates, these are not found in the Akotarika Agama version, which, however, agrees with the Majjhima Nikaya discourse in taking up this world and the next world. Oh, six sense objects. Oh, so that should be in there. Missed that out before. Six elements. Oops. No, hang on. This, this is, this, this is, this is. I didn't complete this. So this is this world. Next world. Uh, and craving. Okay. Um, uh, the Madhima Nikaya version stands alone in also not taking up the four immaterial attainments and what is seen, heard, um, thought, and cognized as experiences in regard to which an Atapindika should avoid clinging and dependencies. Which didn't? Uh, the, all, all of them didn't. Only the. Um, only the Pali did, yeah. The parallels report that an at the end of the Theraputta's instruction, an Atapindika was in tears, as in spite of his devoted service, he had never received such a, an instruction. Now, I won't, won't go on to that. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, And Alio has a footnote here which is also quite pertinent. Uh, he says that the reference to the four immaterial attainments is to some extent quite puzzling, as um, the way other discourses depict an Atapindika does not give any indication that he would have been a meditator of such proficiency as to be capable of entering such uh, the immaterial attainments. So uh, that uh, is, I think, fair enough. Uh, there was another 
comment that he made here that I read earlier that I'm just kind of finding at the moment that uh, that I think answered the question that we had earlier no no about about the the consciousness and how, how consciousness is dependent on consciousness. Yeah, and which what, what that meant is that, that kind of referring to different forms of consciousness and so on. Anyway, the, the basic answer to the question was that that uh, if you look at most of the uh, occasions uh, where it's talking about this, my consciousness will not be dependent on this kind of consciousness, then actually most of those uh, passages don't appear in the parallel versions. So sometimes what happens is that in the in the suttas is that you have a um, <clears throat> um, uh, <clears throat> like a, a particular the, the teaching will be phrased in a particular way with regards to uh, say in this we have various sets of dhammas so we have the eye the ear the nose the tongue and these are things which should all be investigated with uh, insight. And to be let go of, so we see the eye as impermanent, we see the ear as impermanent, and so on and so forth. Investigate them and let them go, uh, and don't let your mind be dependent on that. So this is that statement that we should not let your vinyana be nisitang. Let, don't let your consciousness be dependent on that. So basically, it's just a, it's a statement saying you should let go of them. Um, but what can happen sometimes when the suttas are being passed down is that that those things can be expanded or contracted according to the um, the the uh, vagaries of the oral tradition, so that a certain uh, a passage which might have made sense in the original context uh, then perhaps get it supplied in a, in a context, in another situation where it doesn't make sense quite so well. So I think that's that's what's tending to happen here in the use of the word vinyana or consciousness is that it's actually somewhat unusual to use the word we don't let your consciousness be dependent on those things in that way. Norm normally it just says something like you shouldn't grasp at it or shouldn't be attached to it or something like that. Uh, but in this case, the, 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 actual, the, the important point here uh, as far as understanding the suttas and understanding the dharma is what, what vinyana means and why is vinyana being used in this particular case? So why, when the Buddha is teaching to an Atapindika, doesn't he say just, you know, see the eye as impermanent, let go of it and don't be attached to it? Why does he say, don't let your consciousness be dependent on that? Okay? And that's the, that's the, that's the unusual phrasing in this particular sutta. And so we have to understand why that is... Uh, why it's taught in that way in this particular case. So who's going to tell me? Ah. I don't know for sure, but I would guess because of it being his deathbed, uh -huh. uh, there is hope that as he passes away, he will pass into final nirvana if we... Um, I think he was a bird at the bird stage at that point? I think he was a stream enterer. Just a stream enterer. I think so, yeah. But if his consciousness isn't dependent on anything, Mm. Um, then there would be nothing to hold him to, to any um, internal uh -huh. world. Yeah. He would just pass uh, in, into Nirvana. That is my. Guess. Yeah. It certainly seems that, that Sariputta was kind of reaching for that, doesn't it? Yeah. He's, he's giving him these, these kind of really kind of just take no prisoners kind of teachings, you know? And uh, I think there is something to that, yeah. Also, we have those stories where Mother's trying to find where her consciousness has been mm. born. Right. And it can't. Yeah. Um, because the person's fully enlightened. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I, I agree. I, I think that's also the reason is, is that the term vinyana, we translate as consciousness, but is used specifically or used very, very commonly in the sense of, being, of rebirth. Right? So it's your consciousness is what takes rebirth. So, um, uh, and then because he's just about to die, then basically he's saying, you know, if, you, if your consciousness becomes attached to those things, then that's going to, then you're going to get reborn. Uh, so let go, don't let your consciousness be dependent on any of those things. Yeah? 
Yeah, yeah, so it's not. And then whatever it is, Mano Sampasaja Vedna, mind, uh, a contact, a feeling born of mind contact, Nisitam, Vinyanang Bhavisiti. My mind will not, my consciousness will not be dependent on that thing. But it could be meaning the, uh, uh, um, will not take rebirth dependent on that thing. Right, in fact, that's, that's, that's basically what I think it means, yeah. My mind will not take, my consciousness will not take rebirth dependent on that thing, yeah. Yeah. Stream something? Oh, stream enterer. Stream so stream enter, stream enter is someone on the first stage of enlightenment. Is there anything that into okay, so, so is uh, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, maybe, but that's not that's not quite the issue here. The the point is that uh, there are four stages of uh, enlightenment according to Buddhism. And at the first stage of enlightenment, then someone has let go of certain uh, kinds of fetters or defilements or attachments or whatever, but they still have others left, so they'll still get reborn. They won't get reborn in a in a bad way. They'll only take a good rebirth, but still, why get reborn when you don't have to? So, uh, so it seems that's why Sariputta is giving quite an advanced teaching to him on his deathbed to really sort of. May, you know, make him look at some of those deeper aspects of Dharma which he maybe hasn't been looking at up to there. Yeah, so he can let go at a deeper level. Yeah, seven times at most, yeah. Seven ish. We say it's probably seven ish rather than like a absolute immutable law of the universe. Yeah, I would guess so, yeah. Yep. Oh, you just do it. Yeah, yeah, just, 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 just let go, and then it's just not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that appendicity goes. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, no problems. Well, here it's being taught as a, um, you know, he's saying, he's saying, uh, therefore, uh, layman, or therefore, householder, you should, you should. This is how you should train yourself. And then he's giving him this series of reflections. So it's like he's giving him some, some meditation reflections to be using while he's lying there on his deathbed, yeah? And so he can actually go through them as a reflection. So it won't, my, my mind won't be attached to the eye, my mind won't be attached to my ear, my mind won't be attached to them. And so you can actually just use that uh, as the way it's taught here is just as a reflection. Uh-huh. Yeah. But the, the consciousness not being attached to consciousness. Sorry, yes. Uh uh where are we? Yeah, it comes up in a couple of places. So here in the context of the six elements, na vinyana dhatung uh na chame vinyana dhatu nisitang vinyana bhavisati, so I will not let my consciousness be dependent on the consciousness element. Right. Uh, and then here in the context of the uh, five khandas, I will not let my consciousness be dependent on consciousness in the five khandas. Um, and s- yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's not a normal idiom in the suttas to say I won't let my consciousness be dependent on consciousness. And I think probably... The original formulation was used in the context of the six senses and the six sense objects, saying my consciousness will not be dependent on those things. Uh, and then it kind of got extended to those other categories, more or less, just by a reciter's error, probably. So sometimes you just have to be aware of these things because sometimes you can. Um, uh, I mean, it, 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 sometimes we can have a tendency to try to read more into it than, than we should. Yeah? 
Uh, sometimes it is just an editorial slip-up and we shouldn't be making too much of a big deal. That's not to say that we should be necessarily dismissing it because, yeah, of course, there may be a, a profounder meaning that we're not aware of, and that often happens as well. You know, we read a text, it doesn't make sense at first, but then when we look at it more deeply, it starts to make sense. So we shouldn't kind of dismiss things too lightly because of that. But we just need to try and hold that middle ground uh, where you're sort of um, neither accepting nor rejecting, but just trying to understand it. Uh, and, and after a while you kind of get a sense for what kinds of things are likely to be a, a reciter's error, what kinds of things are likely to be a, a, a sort of an intentional uh, statement. So just, just my, my suspicion is that that formulation in this place is more likely to be a, just a reciter's error rather than um, anything requiring sort of so deeper analysis. No, that that but yes, that's what he is saying. He is saying. Yeah. But you're saying it could just be reciters. No, no, no. I'm saying that the the fact that he says don't let your consciousness be dependent on consciousness mm -hmm. is likely to be a reciter's error. That that probably comes from mechanically applying that same phrase in those other places. Whereas in fact, what it probably simply said was don't let your consciousness be dependent on the eye or the ear or the nose or the tongue or the body or the uh, mind. Yeah, rather than don't let consciousness be dependent on consciousness. Does this be like in four elements and then six elements? Exactly. And and just in here and you give it like an exactly, exactly, yeah. So four elements could have been contained in six elements. It's originally like consciousness in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And five eight, which I probably mean five, good measure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so those those things again, it's very very easy to see how that they they get expanded. Is, is consciousness is not in number rupa, maybe in the listing of number rupa rather than five elements. I don't know. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't say that. But just quickly, what are the whole six elements? Earth. So you know we got that one. That's a kind I've of got four. dirt. I don't know what the other two are. Water, stuff you swim in. Air, the stuff you breathe. Breed, yeah. yeah. Fire, the stuff in the bo metal box oh, downstairs. Gosh. Yeah. Fire. <laughs> <laughs> Space, right? The stuff between your ears. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was almost. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah. and uh, consciousness. Yeah, yeah. The re the real stuff that's actually between your ears. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Six elements. Mm. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what to say about them, but. Uh, I mean, the the main I guess the main thing from a Buddhist point of view to notice is that with the element of space is is um, is uh, is always dependent on the other, so it doesn't really exist independently. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I won't, won't go into too much detail in the in the elements. But anyway, moving along. Okay, so back to the sutta and to Anapindika's response. Now, having just been told not to get attached to anything, he burst into tears. The Venerable Ananda said to him, so obviously it's not just Sariputta there, so obviously when, when, the, when the crying... As the attendant, right. So when, when, um, when, uh, when the crying starts, of course this is in Ananda's territory, not Sariputta. <laughs> Sariputta's thinking, they're sitting there thinking, oh my God, <laughs> pull it together, man. <laughs> Ananda's almost in tears himself. Oh. <laughs> Venerable Ananda asks him, Are you foundering, householder? Are you sinking? <laughs> I'm not foundering, Venerable Ananda. I'm not sinking. But though I have long waited upon the teacher and the bhikkhus worthy of esteem, never before have I heard such talk on the Dhamma. And Ananda said, or Sariputta says, or someone says anyway, 
Uh, such talk on the Dhamma household is not given to lay people clothed in white. Such talk on the Dhamma is given to those who have gone forth. And Anatta Pindika says, well then, Venerable Sariputta, let such talk on the Dhamma be given to lay people clothed in white. There are clansmen with little dust in their ears who are wasting away. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> there are clansmen with little dust in their eyes who are wasting away through not hearing such talk. Well, it must have been dust in their ears because they can't hear the Dhamma. It must be a misprint. There will be those who will understand the Dhamma. So this, of course, this exchange is quite uh, striking. And uh, uh, we know that the Buddha elsewhere said that he, he taught the Dhamma with no inner and outer, without uh, holding anything back. And uh, so, you know, it seems almost a bit kind of, um, you know, stingy. The Buddha sort of criticized this thing of Dhamma Macharya, being stingy with the Dhamma. And yet here it seems almost like the policy is, is being said to be, oh, well, we don't anything, you know, the, the advanced teachings, we don't give to the, um, the, the plebs, but only the, the uh, insiders get the good stuff and you just get the crap. So... Analo has a comment here. Okay, so that story, the, the, that um, the uh, idea that um, that the discourses, such discourses, are not given to the laity, is found both in the Pali and the Madhima and and the uh, Sangutta Agama versions. The commentary explains the reason for this to be that lay followers do not usually like such instructions since they live immersed in possessions and do not appreciate being instructed to give up desire and attachment to these. The uh, identity of the speaker of this explanation is not clear. Uh, so this whoever, whoever actually said this is not clear. It could be Sariputra, it could be Ananda. Um, since no explicit indication is made, uh, and the previous sentence is spoken by Ananda, while Anatapindika's reply is addressed to Sariputta. According to the Sangyukta Agama, uh, it was Sariputta who explained to Anatapindika that for a long time he had not given such instructions to uh, householders. So the Sangyukta Agama makes it clear it was Sariputta rather than Ananda. The Kotra Agama reports that Ananda gave a longer explanation to Ananda Kamindika distinguishing between two types of people. The point made by this explanation might be that teaching methods differ according to the propensity of different individuals. Uh, and Analio uh, actually had a more extensive discussion of this in an earlier version of this paper, uh, and unfortunately that's omitted from the present one, but the gist of that discussion actually we can see if we come back to the Pali uh, dictionary of proper names and we look here at this list of the um, uh, te various teachings given to an Atapindika and various places in the suttas mostly in the Anguttara Nikaya uh, on the importance of having a well guarded mind on the benefits the recipients of food attains the recipients uh, the four obligations that make up the householder's duties, the four conditions of success that are hard to win, four kinds of happiness which a householder should seek, the five kinds of enjoyment which result from wealth rightfully obtained, the five kinds of things that are very desirable but difficult to attain, long life, beauty, happiness, glory, and so on, five sinful acts that justify a man's being called wicked, and the... Um, the last one is somewhat interesting, the inadvisability to, of being satisfied with providing requisites for monks without asking oneself if one also experiences the joy that is born of ease of mind. Okay, so uh, it's not just about offering but also about reflecting on, on yourself. So obviously you have a very strong tendency here in these teachings to Anatapindika himself. Uh, to focus on the uh, the more kind of simple aspects of uh, sort of good advice and common sense and ethics and generosity and so on and so forth, uh, rather than the profound aspects of the Dhamma. And Atapindika, of course, himself, uh, as we noted before, being a wealthy merchant, and that remark in the commentary, of course, being uh, obviously true, that uh, people don't bit like being told give up everything 
and don't be attached to anything, especially people who are very wealthy and obviously do have a lot of attachment to material possessions. And, you know, and in that case, uh, not just that, but an Pindika, you know, as, as someone who's a benefactor also attached not just to the possessions, but to his role as a benefactor, one would presume. So, uh, uh, Analia also points out in the uh, discussion, the earlier discussion, and I think it's unfortunate that he's taken that one out, so I think he's somewhat abbreviated some of these um, uh, chapters, but he, he noted that there are actually many other places in the suttas where you do in fact find quite profound teachings being given to lay people, uh, and where the Buddha, for example, uh, advised the lay people to study the, the, the Brahma Jala Sutta, it's one of the most profound suttas in the Pali Canon, and uh, many other places where uh, deep teachings are in fact given to householders. So I don't think that this statement is meant to be uh, taken as a sort of absolute thing, uh, but I think uh, gen I think that that point that the commentary makes is actually quite a good one. That it's if 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 it is true that it's, these teachings are less often given to lay people, it's not out of a sense of not wanting to teach them the uh, more profound aspects of the Dhamma, but it's about what what people are interested in hearing, uh, and so most times the, uh, the lay people. Uh, are interested in hearing the the more simple dhammas and are not so um, uh, uh, not so enthusiastic about being told that they should let go of everything. And uh, anybody who's done any teaching uh, for lay people will know that that's obviously the case, and it's perfectly understandable. It's just that you teach for uh, whatever people are uh, interested to hear. Don't don't force them on on them things that are um, uh, not. I think it was just about the. It was probably. I think it's. I think if I remember correctly, it might have been. There's a stock passage on teaching of giving and, and virtue and uh, and so on, and then. But then and then it goes up to the the, the four noble truths. So yeah. I think I think that's the case. I think it's that stock teaching. Yeah. And that particular stock teaching is actually interesting because that's some way that you find many times that that in the it's abbreviated many times in the uh, vinaya and other places you know um, you know you're familiar with the passage i'm talking about he spoke about uh, generosity and virtue and the 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 the, the advantages of of uh, giving up and the dangers of attachment and and so on and then up to the four noble truths heaven and, and heaven and hell and so on yeah it's gradual teaching and it's fascinating that that teaching is summarized in many places, but there's nowhere in anywhere in any of the schools or any of the traditions where that's actually spelled out in detail. Not, not, not the same. I mean, all of the parts of it are, but not the whole thing as a whole. Not the whole thing. Yeah, each each individual section. Yes, but there's no one place where all of that, all of those are, are spelled out in detail. Sure, yeah. It depends on the understanding of the Rishi Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I remember in some, uh, one of the men who used to come to us, uh -huh. I remember that man. Yes, of course. How could I forget? Yeah. And when you come to the water, the water sitting in another river. Yeah. And uh, 10 years later, he's in another way. Mm. And 20 years later, he's in a way that that man cannot stand to another country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 In this particular, as Susan, um, seems quite reasonable if someone is, is like, like, like someone's gone forth is willing to give up everything external, basically. Right. So isn't willing to even give up that, then how mm. they are, how actually are they going to give up the internal things as well? Mm. Mm. Sort of, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but even... Yeah, like, sort of dummy-level teachings. <laughs> Sorry, but like, I mean, like, oh, you know, the benefits of receiving food or something. Yeah. You think you can do a little bit more than that. 
Yeah, but but you know, it really it really just depends on different people's character. Maybe he just wasn't very. You know, it, sometimes people are just not interested in in those kinds of things. You know, uh, it very much is is dependent on people's personalities. Yeah, I mean, there is there are some people who you know just you know they just like to ask you these questions about dependent origination and all that kind of thing and so on. And then there are other people who maybe go to the Buddhist center for their whole lives, and just are very happy to come and serve and. But but even even so, it's just a personality type, yeah. you know. He maybe well, has. Yeah. Yeah. But but that I mean, but that's not saying as an absolute, but just as a, as a generalization, right. that you know that they, they they tend to be you know they tend to be more of an interest in, you know, living a good and a happy life in that situation, uh, rather than a sense of sort of you know fight complete liberation from things. But I mean, there, there, there. You know, there clearly is that that distinction in the teachings that there are some teachings given more on a conventional level, and some for the the sake of the the higher goals, um, and that's somewhat, you know, somewhat correlated with the teachings for the lay and the, the sangha. But but you know, on the on the other hand, then there are, there are plenty of teachings for the sangha which are very simple on a very basic level as well, and uh, and also as I said, plenty of teachings for the lay people which are very advanced. So it's by no means a hard and fast uh, distinction, but just a sort of a gen general tendency. So, <clears throat> okay, okay. So then, um, after giving the household and Pindika this advice, Venerable Sariputta. And the Venerable Ananda arose from their seats and departed. Soon after they left, the householder Anatapindika died and reappeared in the Tusita heaven. Then when the night was well advanced, Anatapindika, now a young god of beautiful appearance, went to the Blessed One, illuminating the whole of Jeta's grove. After paying homage to the Blessed One, he stood at one side and addressed the Blessed One in stanzas. O oh, blessed is this Jeta's grove, dwelt in by the sagely Sangha, wherein resides the king of Dhamma, the font of all my happiness. See, he's the font of all his happiness. And... <laughs> Next font we make, we'll have to call it the king of Dhamma. By, by, actu, by action, knowledge and Dhamma, by virtue and noble way of life, by these are mortals purified and not by lineage or wealth. Therefore a wise person who sees what truly leads to his own good should investigate the Dhamma and purify himself with it. Sariputta has reached the peak in, in virtue, peace and wisdom's ways. Any bhikkhu who has gone beyond at best can only equal him. That's what the young god Anatapindika said, and the teacher approved. Then the young god Anatapindika, thinking, the teacher has approved of me, paid homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on his right, he vanished at once. And then, when the night had ended, the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus, telling them of everything that had happened. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Surely, Venerable Sir, that young god must have been Anatapindika, for the householder Anatapindika had perfect confidence in the Venerable Sariputta. Good, good, Ananda, you have deduced the right conclusion that young God was an Atapindika, no one else. That's what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Uh, and so here, um, okay, let's uh, just look at the parallels. Uh, the Pali and the Chinese parallels report that an Atapindika passed away. Um, and... Uh, they, the Pali and one of the Sangukta Agama versions say he was born in the Tusita and one of the, and the Ekotarika Agama version says he was born in the, in the Tavatinksa heaven. Uh, Tusita is a bit kind of higher up in the, in the heavenly hierarchy. So, uh, <laughs> no, they just, just, they just happen to be there. Yeah. They're down under. They're lower than any of those. Yeah. Yeah, the realm of the four great kings. One of them is the Gandalas. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So all of the versions have the set of stanzas. Um, the Kotrika Agma only has the first stanza. Um, 
uh, but they and the the Sanyukta Agama version has uh, some some parallels to the other stanzas. Uh, they all have some stanzas, but there's, they differ in what exactly they are. But they only have the first one is the first stanza is the only one they all have in common. Um, according to the Okotarika Agama, the visiting deva also informed the Buddha of his identity and scattered heavenly flowers on the Buddha as well as on Ananda and Sariputta. Uh, so this implies that Ananda was present when the deva revealed his identity which is a bit problematic because later on in the same discourse, this is the Akotarika Agama version, the Buddha asked Ananda who that deva could have been and then praised Ananda for rightly uh, uh, inferring that it had been an Atapindika. So a bit of internal incoherence in that one uh, and that being quite characteristic of the Akotarika Agama. Um, okay. So uh, and just another look, minor minor point, but from from the point of view of uh, Buddhist epistemology, is also just the the last statement to Ananda is also quite interesting. Of course, uh, in in Buddhism, uh, it's uh, believed that you can know these things like rebirth and so on according to your uh, psychic powers. And so here, uh, Ananda is is he coming to an understanding of who that Deva was, not by any psychic powers, but by his reasoning. And uh, I've mentioned, and this is maybe many of those who've been interested in the, the the philosophy classes and so on. And I've mentioned that in Buddhism we have like these two um, uh, uh, two forms of of knowledge. One being direct uh, direct vision is pachaka and the other one being insight or uh, being sorry inference or anumana and uh, so here uh, ananda uses a form of anumana form of in inference uh, saying that well because uh, anatapindika was greatly faithful in sariputta then the fact that he gave these verses in praise the, the deva gave these verses in praise of sariputta implies that the deva was none other than anatapindika and the buddha praises him for that uh, Yavatakang saying, uh, Buddha's words of praise saying, Sadhu, Sadhu, Ananda, Yavatakang, Ko Ananda, Takaya, Patabang. So, uh, as far as by reason, uh, what, what, what by reason is to be attained or what is to be reached by reason, that has been reached by you. That's the literal translation uh, of those words, which are translated by the by Bhikkhu Bodhi as you have deduced the right conclusion. So, literally, what the Buddha says is, uh, what can be reached uh, by reason, you have reached it, or that has been reached by you. Takaya patabang. Yeah. Yeah, by taka. Yeah, by taka by reason. So and and you know it's just it's just it's just a little point, but it's just sort of worth noting that you know uh, that that the Buddha isn't you know criticizing or anything he's praising ananda for his his um you know proper use of inference in that case well yeah obviously yeah he liked him yeah maybe it's just personal maybe but still i mean still i still i, I still find it a little bit odd i mean even if he liked sariputta surely he'd like the buddha more i don't know but yeah i, I, I don't know yeah, I don't Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, would have quite possibly could have been occupied. But even then, I mean, surely, you know, when the kind of the chief lay disciple died, it's hard to imagine what else he would have occupied with that was more important. But maybe he's, well, maybe. Like, he's so humble that, you know, mm -hmm. he yeah. Mm, probably more likely, yeah. Yeah, so he gets there. Maybe Buddha was already there before. Also quite possible, yeah. Yeah, it could have been in other visits that we haven't. Uh, heard of. So. Yeah, <laughs> what do you expect? And so after that uh, ending, uh, the one of the the Majjhima Nikaya and, two Sangyuk, and one of the two Sangyukta Agama versions end there. Uh, the other Sangyukta Agama version adds a stanza spoken by the Buddha in praise of Sariputta. 
Um, whereas according to the Akotarika Agama account, the Buddha delivered a long prose passage in praise of Ananda. Hmm. Okay, so that's the uh, Anattapindako Vada Sutta. So since uh, we have some time before six o'clock, and since uh, next sutta is not all that long, uh, how about we do the Channa Vada Sutta as well? Yeah. Sounds good.